joins us down the line. Stefan, delighted to have you with us. Um, we won't ask you about Disneyland, Asterix, or anything like that. Um, let's just um, get straight to the markets. And of course, um, the big thing we're looking ahead to is the U.S. jobs number today. All kinds of adjectives to describe it from unimaginable to heartbreaking. Um, the thing is, risk assets at least keep looking through the underlying data. Are you positioning the portfolio in such a way as to expect that trend to continue? We are a little bit cautious in our portfolio positioning uh, right now because we think that uh, as far as, for example, equity markets are concerned, uh, they are, um, I would say, pricing uh, a favorable scenario in terms of, uh, you know, economic development, which is uh, what I would say a V-shaped uh, recovery, which would mean uh, most of the economic damage being done in the first half of 2020 uh, and then uh, a reasonable return to normal in 2020. So, Stefan, I mean, so looking at the kind... Sorry, go, go on. So, so, for example, we are slightly underweight at this stage in equities. We favor uh, U.S. and Asian equities uh, um, mainly, and we have put also protection in our client portfolio in the form of uh, uh, put option, a long put option on equity indices. Now, Stefan, what I was going to ask you was, was whether how far what you're thinking about now is in any way affected by the news that we are having trade talks of a kind, at least, between Beijing and Washington and what that might set up for the shape of a recovery. Uh, are you reading much into that at the moment? Yes, uh, it, it, uh, there are two elements that are not very good news uh, right now in the market. There is definitely uh, the rhetoric that started to come back a little bit on trade talk between uh, the U.S. and China. But our understanding is that uh, uh, since they are resuming uh, the, 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 the talks, there is a little bit of a better market uh, sentiment. Uh, so we need to monitor this development, but there is clearly a risk that uh, the Trump administration tried to blame, you know, the situation on China in a, a year of uh, elections uh, for President Trump. The other thing that uh, gets us a little bit worried is the situation in Europe with uh, the uh, Karlsruhe court ruling, you know, uh, asking uh, the ECB to justify itself uh, against, uh, uh, you know, its uh, previous uh, uh, program. Uh, um, and that's not very good news because to a large extent it puts uh, the uh, kind of German uh, uh, jurisdiction above uh, uh, the European jurisdiction from uh, uh, you know, a German point yeah. of view, and you can imagine that um, uh, to a large extent, this situation uh, is a situation that can put uh, the project of European Union at risk. Yeah, so a lot of risks out there, Stefan, yet you were saying just a moment ago that the V-shaped recovery is still perhaps what you're expecting. And while I was saying that, you know, risk assets have been looking through the data, if we look at the bond markets, it's a bit of a different story. The two-year and five-year Treasury yield hit record lows yesterday. That seemed to have been triggered by Fed funds futures pricing a negative Fed rate in 2021. How much does that actually catch your attention in terms of making changes to the portfolio or do you just see it as um, sort of traders trying to make profit here? So, Nera, there are two aspects uh, to it. First, uh, you know, the, the, the low uh, yield environment is clearly uh, a factor that supports equity valuation. That, so for us, it's a big part of the explanation of, uh, you know, the high level that we observe on equity. Our uh, kind of fair value estimate of where the S&P 500 should be, uh, you know, uh, by the end of the year is 2,900. So we are not very far from there, and hence we have a more cautious approach. Now the second part uh, of your question, which is negative rate uh, in, 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 in the U.S., we think that, uh, you know, uh, from uh, a long time, there is a little bit of a philosophical uh, issue on this. I think both the U.K. and uh, the U.S., uh, are considering for the time being, are not considering for the time being going into negative rates because there are several issues with it. Well, clearly, negative rates are not very good for your uh, financial sector uh, because, you know, it's difficult to put uh, a deposit rate uh, uh, negative, so the margin of the banks uh, is limited. But also, 
uh, countries that have gone negative rate, like Switzerland, like uh, you know uh, the eurozone, are countries that have, to a certain extent, given up on uh, their hope of uh, having the inflation close to their target. And I think that the U.S. and the U.K. are countries where you still have a little, you had a little bit more inflation, let's say, than uh, in in, in yeah. core Europe or in Japan, and and I don't think that the authorities in that part of the world have already made uh, that kind of psychological move. Stefan, let me ask you finally about something which we've been talking about a lot recently, oil, and obviously the effect on oil majors, oil economists. Interesting, Goldman Sachs now saying global oil demands on an improving trajectory may exceed supply by the end of June. Now that's a turnaround. Are, are you impressed by that? Well, I, I would tend to, to disagree uh, with Goldman Sachs on, on this one. I think that clearly, you know, the, 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 the demand uh, is going to improve progressively as, you know, the economy uh, recovers. But I think that there is so much supply uh, available and so much uh, stock that our own forecast is for the price of oil to go towards $40 a barrel in uh, 2021 and stay pretty much stable uh, there. Okay, Stefan, thank you so much for being with us. That was Stefan Monnier, CIO at Lombard Odier, giving us a sense of what's going on perhaps in the global economy and how much elements of optimism there might be out there as we move towards the weekend. Uh, Caroline Hepko is back on Daybreak Europe next. She'll be previewing today's U.S. non-farm payrolls number with Bloomberg Opinions' Marcus Ashworth. The sense that these figures are so bad, but also that much of the badness of them has been priced in. So how is the market approaching that? This is Daybreak Europe. This is Bloomberg. Portfolio Analyst. For more than 20 years, ASDA supported our communities. We've raised over £23 million for Fair Share and the Trussell Trust. And recently, we've donated supplies to frontline NHS workers and carers. We've always been proud to serve those around us. Visit asda.com forward slash creating change for better. ASDA. We're all in this together. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care. About each other. About our planet. About creating a better world for everyone. And becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Make sure to accept your offer by the UCAS deadline and visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. TSB believe in people helping people. So if, for whatever reason, you become an innocent victim of fraud, they will refund every penny you lost from your TSB account. Find out more about their fraud refund guarantee at tsb.co.uk. Terms and conditions apply. Max is dreaming of riding a giant chameleon whilst fighting a clan of ninjas. But in reality, he's helping fight COVID-19 in his sleep. Like thousands of others, he's joined the Dream Team. By using the Dream Lab app, they're helping scientists speed up the search for potential treatments. I'll fight you. You go, Max. Search Vodafone Dream Lab and join the Dream Team tonight. Dream Lab app is owned by Vodafone Foundation, an independent charity. Registration number 1089625. Full terms at vodafone.co.uk slash dreamlab. Today at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. The idea is to rehold really the economy in suspended animation until we get control of this virus. We are very much in a picture of monetary dominance. We will get slower growth. I mean, let's not get confused about that. We are in a national crisis. I think it is for all parties to pull together. The euro area is facing an economic contraction of a magnitude and speed that are unprecedented in peacetime. Bloomberg Daybreak Europe on Bloomberg Radio. A very good morning from London. I'm Caroline Hebke. Thank you for joining me here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, where the main story in the UK is the government trying to play down these expectations that lockdown will be significantly rolled back. Uh, we're worried, of course, about the R rate, the infection rate in Britain, which scientists admitted yesterday is actually creeping up in the UK. Uh, this, of course, ahead of Boris Johnson speaking to us on about the plan uh, and what is the way forward. Meanwhile, is it one app or two? Because Britain rolled out its first contact tracing app on Thursday on the Isle of Wight. But now news reported in the FT that the NHS is developing a second app 
this time actually using the technology of Apple and Alphabet's Google, which isn't what apparently the first app is based on. So rival apps, would it mean that the UK can move forward in terms of uh, unwinding the lockdown? And then, of course, over in America, the big number that we're waiting for is the April payroll data. We already know it's going to be terrible, that we're going to see millions of Americans having lost their jobs. Uh, Bloomberg Economics talking about an unprecedented 33 3 million job losses. As for the markets then this morning, before we get into the meat of our conversations with our guests uh, this morning, we have the UK markets closed, of course. It's a bank holiday in Britain. Uh, we commemorate the end of World War II in Europe. Winston Churchill speaking at three o'clock uh, on this day, 75 years ago. But in terms of the European markets uh, overall this morning, actually it's, it is fairly positive risk on up half of 1% after we had a positive equity trading session in Asia where we saw gains in Japan, Hong Kong and across China. Uh, at the moment, uh, the Zetra DAX is uh, also just higher, eight tenths of 1% at the moment. In terms of the futures for the US market, if you're getting ready uh, for that, S&P 500 E-mini futures gain eight tenths of 1%. We had the big news yesterday and overnight of the new milestone for the NASDAQ, uh, turning positive for 2020, topping $100 billion in value. Uh, the NASDAQ futures currently higher, eight tenths of 1%. And in the bond market um, this morning, 64 basis points is where we trade for US benchmark. 10-year yield, but actually it's the two-year that really uh, has caused a lot more interest. Fed fund futures um, basically predicting that, the, that US interest rates could go negative. So we have the two-year yield very close to zero at 13 basis points this morning. Uh, and in the oil markets, gains on WTI crude futures up by 4.8% right now. So that's a little look at the markets uh, for you this morning. Let's talk about uh, that a bit more with our guests this morning. So Bloomberg's Bureau Chief Sharon Chen is live for us in Beijing. Very good morning to you. And Bloomberg Opinions market columnist Marcus Ashworth joins us this morning. Equity futures uh, for the US trading higher also after of course the top trade negotiators from China and the US pledged to cooperate on the economy and on public health. Sharon, how big a step forward is this? Because the, the tension and the rhetoric has been very high between the two superpowers. Yes, I mean, on one hand, it is they, they are meant to catch up every six months. It's part of the deal. And so, I mean, this phone call is slightly ahead of schedule, although it does make sense that they would meet to talk because the virus has really upended everything in both um, the U.S. and China's economies. Um, but you're right that it is really significant that, you know, they still have held this phone call and they basically tried to project a very positive message, even though Trump has, you know, threatened to terminate the deal or even even slap even more tariffs on China as part of his whole um, attempt to blame the virus and the origins of it on China. And, you know, tensions between the two have really reached a, a new low um, amid the virus. So it is pretty significant that they still met. Yes, exactly, that they were still speaking. So, of course, that's uh, Stephen Mnuchin, the, the um, Treasury Secretary, uh, and also the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, along with China's Vice Premier Liu He. So they were involved in this uh, call that happened Friday, Beijing time. Um, look, the other big number, uh, Marcus, that I mentioned is the payroll data out of the U.S. I mean, we were expecting uh, job creation to have just cratered last month, right? Well, yeah, I mean, job creation. creation <laughs> I that. Yeah. Those are the days. Um, but it could be anywhere between somewhere around 20 million to even potentially 30 million. And that's, that's the whole point. I mean, economic forecasts are um, conjectural at the best of times, but this one really is so random. Um, and I think it will serve as a message, um, perhaps, that, you know, quite how um, extreme this, this uh, switch around has been from the, from the virus. and. The stock markets don't seem to pay much attention to it at the moment. They, they're looking past it. But I still think this one will really hit home. And it's going to be very difficult politically. And it's going to be very diff difficult economically to manage this. Um, mm. And I think it's, it's, just, a, it's just a real uh, lodestar number. And um, we, as I said, it could be anywhere. Most of the forecasts center around the early 20 millions. <laughs> it's literally, mm. you know, 22 million, maybe 20 million. It's that, it's that very, very hard to, to tell. As far as uh, uh, claim, jobless claims are concerned, 
We're up close to 35 million, but not all of that will necessarily feed through into the month of April. Yeah, indeed. Sharon, of course, a lot of people in Europe and in the United States are looking to China, you know, first in and first out of the pandemic as a kind of a beacon of hope. Um, the the jobless data um, in China seems uh, quite obscure, difficult to, to read. What is the picture there in terms of China going back to work? Yeah, like you say, it is very difficult to judge from the official data exactly how the work resumption is going. Um, you know, a lot of economists also have different ways of tracking it. They look at traffic, they look at pollution, they look at um, all these kinds of things. The official unemployment rate um, hit a record high in February and then it went down a little bit um, after that. But, you know, we're getting a lot of anecdotal reports that there are a lot of people who are who have lost their jobs in the tens of millions. Um, some economists estimate, and also the government has you know really made this a priority. They've talked consistently about protecting jobs, about helping um, poorer people, migrant workers who don't have jobs. I mean, they also realize that this is a huge um, risk for them if there are going to be tens of millions of people who are unemployed. And so the government reaction is kind of more indicative of how big the problem is rather than any of the official figures. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it becomes at some point, doesn't it, a sort of social tinderbox to have such numbers of uh, people unemployed looking for work. Um, Marcus, um, this sort of ties in also, I think, with the comments that Christine Lagarde made yesterday, speaking on that webinar that was organised by Bloomberg. You know, she was defending the ECB, saying that this is an unprecedented uh, economic crisis. The ECB is going to do all that it can, and it has to use those unconventional uh, monetary policy tools. But are we going to get any more from the ECB? Marcus. A uh, high-level spat that will, that will go on for some while. Uh, in the meantime, I think that the uh, ECB, a uh, bit like the Bank of England did yesterday, are just holding their powder dry a little bit on further quantitative easing. That will come. Um, certainly another $100 million for the Bank of England in June, and then probably again another $100 million in August. The ECB has got a likely another $500 billion, um, give or take a few, few hundred, um, which may come any time from, net, from basically the, over the start of the summer um, throughout the end of it. I mean, they've got enough theoretically to last probably till the end of the year with the extra 750 they loaded up. So they've got 1.1 trillion to spend this year, um, but they will need to reload for 2021 and get that market's confidence. So it's more a question of, you know, if Italian bond spreads go out, then maybe they'll bring that um, forward, uh, and if they don't... Um, then, then perhaps they'll, they'll just buy their time a little bit closer to the end of the year. But, uh, and this is a big but, they also have other stuff that they are actively doing, which is effectively lowering interest rates down to negative 100 basis points through this whole Teltro and now uh, also some additional types of uh, funding. So they are, they are attacking on all fronts, not just on quantitative easing bond buying, not just on interest rates, but also with pumping money into the economy and, and essentially really making it super attractive for, for banks to borrow. Yeah, indeed. What did you make then um, in all of this of, of the Bank of England? Of course, um, Andrew Bailey spoke to us on Bloomberg, speaking to Francine Lacroix. Um, you know, he was saying basically no holes barred. You know, wasn't ruling anything out, uh, even though, you know, the prediction from uh, or the kind of scenario that the Bank of England laid out was 14% cratering in GDP for the UK this year. And then actually quite a strong rebound next year, 15%. Yeah, I don't take too much. Uh, it wasn't even an economic forecast; it was a scenario. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> as I said before, economic forecasting is conceptual the best of the time, and this one really is. It's just a concept, and um, they're just trying to picture out what they would sort of best guess, literally at that. So, if you read the statement, it was seven to um, to continue with the current plan of uh, the extra two hundred billion, but two members want, went for an extra hundred million billion now. Now that. It seems like there might be dissension in the ranks. There isn't at all. Everyone's on board with adding an extra $100 billion in June, I would think, almost certainly. The question I, I thought most interesting that, that, that Bailey put up there was he wasn't saying that they are going to do uh, drop interest rates below zero into negative rates, but equally, he wasn't ruling it out either. And that's what he said, no holds barred. And that is a fascinating concept that possibly the Bank of England may look at uh, if 
They're buying themselves an extra month for June. If by June, the, the lockdown, some of it will lifted. If the economy is really not bouncing back how they expect it in that scenario they painted of a sharp dip, but then good chances it bounces back, then and possibly then we may be looking at a negative rates in the UK. And as you start off the program with saying, it, uh, the two-year rate going down to sort of 13 basis points or whatever, that opens up the window that possibly the Fed may be next to follow sometime in the summer. Gosh, okay, very interesting. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. That's Bloomberg Opinions Market Commonist uh, Marcus Ashworth and also Bloomberg's Bureau Chief Sharon Chen live in Beijing for us on the big themes this morning. Right, let's bring you up to speed, though, with where we are in terms of world and national news. It's Bloomberg's Leanne Gerrans. Good morning. Caroline, good morning and thank you. I'm just going to start with some breaking news lines we have this morning. The World Health Organization is currently giving a special briefing on animal origins of the coronavirus. They say the Wuhan market played a role in the spread of COVID-19, but the exact role of the market is unclear. According to the WHO, the coronavirus origin linked to food is not unique. Coronaviruses usually jump from animals to humans, scientists are saying. Cats and ferrets have now shown they are susceptible to COVID-19. We'll bring you more of those lines throughout the morning. Now, here in the UK, the government is looking to dampen public expectations of a significant lifting of lockdown measures. At the same time, scientific advisers are warning the rates of infection has crept up. Bloomberg's Charles Capel reports. Prime Minister Boris Johnson will address the nation on Sunday evening to lay out the government's plans to ease restrictions, which are expected to be more modest than those reported in British newspapers. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab said any changes in the short term would be small and incremental and suggested different parts of the UK could relax the lockdown at different speeds. Raab also warned that the restrictions could be tightened again if the rate of infection increases to a dangerous level. In London, Charles Capel, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Crossing over to the Southern Hemisphere, Australia has announced a three-phase plan to reopen its economy. That says its success in flattening the curve of new coronavirus infections allows it to relax lockdown restrictions. According to Prime Minister Scott Morrison, by July, the plan should see the restoration of some 850,000 jobs lost during the crisis. And today, European leaders are marking the 75th anniversary of V-Day. This comes as much of the continent remains under lockdown to prevent and the spread of coronavirus. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. For the Jewish Communal Fund, Noel Spiegel, former senior partner with Deloitte & Touche and past JCF president, discusses the advantages of a donor-advised fund over a private foundation. There's a lot involved in having a private foundation. You need to engage attorneys, you need to engage accountants, file tax returns. At JCF, all of that is done for you. You don't have to get involved in anything other than making your contribution to your fund and then determining which grants that you want to make. A JCF fund may be opened with a minimum $5,000 contribution of cash or appreciated securities and can be used as an alternative to or together with a private foundation. If you have a foundation, you have to list all of the contributions that you made. Potentially anybody, because the information is public, can find out exactly which organizations a foundation has made charitable contributions to. Let JCF simplify your philanthropy and protect your privacy. Learn more about JCF's private client group at jcfny.org. The market is unpredictable. BAM gives you certainty. In the face of volatility and illiquidity, BAM insured municipal bonds deliver default protection, value preservation, and a durable AA rating from SP. BAM's insurance protects against everything that causes a default, including natural disasters, financial fraud, pension issues, and economic disruption, like the one we're experiencing right now. BAM. Build America Mutual. Ask your broker about BAM insured municipal bonds. To protect his home and family from disaster, Steve used courage, wisdom, and his camera phone. That should do it. Way to go, Steve! By simply taking digital pictures of his family's important documents, Steve can always have them stored safely online, no matter when disaster strikes. Learn other simple ways to protect your home and family before a natural disaster at ready.gov. That's ready.gov. A message from FEMA and the Ad Council. Influential conversations from Bloomberg Television. 
Here's Aslinda Amin. Lockdown measures appear to be having a significant effect on broadcast and online entertainment. Our next guest runs streaming startup iFlakes, which is available in 13 emerging markets. The company says monthly active user numbers have jumped in the last two months. Let's bring in CEO Mark Barnett. Mark, good to have you with us. Uh, can you quantify the jump for us? I think the jump for us is we've seen users and usage double over the last two months and so it, it's been a, a sort of phenomenal period and and at a sort of numbers level we've seen uh, upstream 55 centuries of content to mobile devices in April and seen our ad impressions jump fourfold during that period and so it, it's, it's certainly been well beyond uh, any expectations in the short term but in a lot of ways I think what we're seeing is the acceleration of what has been a massive trend for our generation. And we've all been moving away from traditional TV and taking control of entertainment, our own entertainment experiences. And being locked up together for the last six to eight weeks has, has accelerated something that probably would have taken a few years to occur and, and made it happen immediately. Hear more interviews like this one on Bloomberg Television, streaming live on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg mobile app. Or check your local cable listings. Markets, headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day. At Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app and on QuickTake by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Good morning from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York City. I'm Anne Marie Hordern with this Bloomberg Radio Business Flash. It's a risk on Friday, really around the entire world this morning. The CSI 300 and the Hang Seng both closed higher, about 1%. In Europe, the FTSE 100, the UK market is closed for a bank holiday, but France, Germany, and Spain all higher this morning, as well as the Eurostox 50, up nearly five tenths of a percent. And US futures also rallying uh, ahead of the US Open this morning in the green. Uh, one driver, of course, was this positive dialogue that emerged between Beijing and Washington on the trade front. And one of the statements, uh, one of the things said that the, they fully, uh, both countries fully expect to meet their obligations under the agreement in spite of the pandemic. And after that call, U.S. futures hit highs following that. Uh, most important piece of economic data today, though, of course, is going to be the U.S. jobs report. It's said to be an historic one and a tragic one, erasing a decade of job gains in a single month. In the Treasury market, it's all about the two-year yield, extending their drop up altering uh, excuse me after plunging to a record that yield right now is 0.18% in the oil market this morning WTI is trading just under $25 a barrel Brent above $30 a barrel Saudis had a price hike yesterday a bit of a peace flag in terms of the price and market share war and then I wanted to just mention it's a Friday Bitcoin briefly overnight it touched above $10,000 we haven't seen that since February right now it's trading at 9838 that's a Bloomberg Business Flash now here's Leanne Garens with more on what's going on around the world good morning Leanne Good morning, Anne-Marie, and thank you. France will start rolling back its lockdown measures at joining Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands in easing restrictions. But strict controls will remain on public transport in Paris, where infection rates are still high. Looser restrictions on businesses and stores will start coming into effect on Monday. Now, the next health crisis linked to coronavirus could be a wave of suicides. Isolation and anxiety are a recipe for substance abuse use and mental illness. That is according to a new study by researchers in the U.S. which predicts 75,000 deaths of despair. Experts are warning the economic uncertainty and social isolation caused by the pandemic are overwhelming people. And North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has sent a message of support to Chinese President Xi Jinping for his handling of the coronavirus pandemic. State media say Kim congratulated Xi for containing the crisis and controlling the situation, but very little is lo- known about the virus outbreak in North Korea. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg.